Good day, my name is Tobias Osborne. Welcome to Introduction to General Relativity. I'm looking forward to you joining me on this journey through physics most elegant and beautiful of theories. I vividly recall the lecture in my first year physics degree where I first encountered general relativity. At the time, I was strongly contemplating a move to computer science, but after that lecture, I was hooked. I remember being amazed at the connection between the curvature of space-time and the motion of freely falling bodies. This is really the subject that drew me into physics in the first place. It's not the one that kept me here, but it's certainly the one that drew me here. And I'm looking forward to teaching you this most amazing and elegant of theories. It's really no exaggeration that physicists regard general relativity as one of the most beautiful physical theories that we have. The words elegant and beautiful are very appropriately uh, describe the theory of general relativity. Indeed, there's somehow an element of the divine in the way that general relativity works and holds together. And I am very much looking forward to sharing all of this with you in the coming course. But I should say, before we go too much into this course, it must be said that general relativity is wrong. It's wrong because, as far as we know, it doesn't, is not compatible with the theory of quantum mechanics, or at least not in a way that's compelling. So we need to correct or find a deeper, more underlying theory for the, the, the physics of nature itself. Nonetheless, even though general relativity is wrong, it has proven to be spectacularly successful in almost all cosmological uh, areas. It, the predictions of general relativity have been uh, confirmed to an extraordinary level of degree of accuracy. What's the format of this lecture? So this lecture series will cover some thir 10 to 13 weeks. There will be approximately two lectures a week. I will record the videos for the lectures. It will be presented asynchronously and I will upload the lectures usually on Monday or Tuesday in the week. For students at the Leibniz University of Hanover, you can find all information regarding the organization and the examination requirements for this course on the StudIP webpage. There will be a textbook that I will be following for this course. The textbook will be that of uh, Wald. This is Wald's general relativity textbook. This is Wald's general relativity textbook that we will be following in this course. Um, however, I won't be uh, following it to the page or the letter, um, and there I will deviate occasionally, indeed, straight away from the book to introduce uh, material from other sources. I think it's worth mentioning uh, two, two sources in particular that, that I will be I will spend, uh, I, I will consult for additional material. There's the so-called telephone book, Misner, Thorne and Wheeler. Um, this massive book is a fantastic discussion of uh, gen all aspects of general relativity. I will certainly be consulting uh, this book on occasion. And also Weinberg's Gravitation and Cosmology uh, is really a fantastic resource for explicit calculations. Now, the presentation, or the, rather the, the structure of this course, the emphasis in this course will be over mathematical methods over the physics. So, my ultimate goal is to introduce to you the mathematics and the mathematical methods underlying general relativity. Of course, I will not be neglecting the physics, and I will be indeed spending uh, a long time talking about the physical uh, basis for the general relativity. But it is certainly my goal to spend uh, a long time introducing you to the mathematical methods of general relativity. And there's a multiple reasons why one might want to do that. Um, although, I mean, you can discuss general relativity practically without ever really seriously getting in, delving into differential geometry, you can work you, most of the time with one coordinate patches we'll see and one coordinate system 
you can talk about the motion of particles in a curved space-time uh, without making reference to geodesic equations and coordinate free notation, blah, blah, blah. We can do general relativity in a very concrete and explicit way, and you will certainly find references and resources where that's the case. However, I do want to spend some time getting you familiar with the mathematical methods of general relativity, in particular, the mathematical methods of differential geometry. For many of you, this is the first time you will see differential geometry and, uh, and use these tools in earnest. Differential geometry isn't really necessary to describe much of the phenomena of physics the up to now in your, your degree, in your studies of physics. However, you will find that if you want to go further in physics, that it underlies multiple, it underlies multiple uh, current research areas in, in, in physics, and most, most notably, any time you want to do anything with quantum gravity and string theory, you'd better be sure that you are up to date with your differential geometry knowledge and also uh, the, the basic methods, theorems and results from differential geometry. So that's why we're going to spend a lot of time in this course building this theory up the theory isn't in all of its its breadth and depth isn't strictly needed to describe most of the content of general relativity. However, you will need it for any further uh, studies in physics, and certainly if you wish to pursue a research career in physics, a knowledge of differential geometry can do no wrong. I should mention that there's some additional resources. Uh, there's perhaps the. My favorite video re reference would be the, the videos of Lenny Susskind on general relativity. Uh, do check them out. He has an absolutely different perspective to the perspective that I'll be presenting here. And I would say completely complementary perspective to the perspective I'm presenting here. So do check out Lenny Susskind's videos on general relativity. So that's it for the basic organizational uh, announcements for this course. From now on, we will be commencing our studies of Einstein's theory of general relativity. And in particular, we're going to commence today in lecture one with pre-relativity gravitation. So how is it? It's a short review of gravitation, the theory of gravitation before relativity before the, uh, it was combined with the theory of relativity by Einstein. Now, I should point out that I'm assuming, before I go on, I realize I should point out that I'm going to assume some prior knowledge. I'm going to assume that you know, in particular, there's one thing I really assume, and that is that you've, you've self-studied or you've seen a course or you've participated in a course on special relativity. This is really vital. I will not pause to review most of the uh, concepts of special relativity. We're going to go straight in and be uh, discussing all aspects of general relativity uh, without uh, too much review of the special relativity foundations. Do make sure you know this stuff. You can get this in a multitude of places now, videos, books, tutorials. Um, if you speak German, then you can certainly take a look at my Theoretische Physik R videos, in particular at the last couple of videos in that course, I uh, gave an introduction to special relativity. Actually, it's probably the material I discussed there would be sufficient uh, basis for this course. Furthermore, I'm going to assume a little bit more. I'm going to assume that you know calculus. Uh, that, that's, ex that's extremely vital. We can't do calculus or manifolds if we don't know calculus. You've got to know that, learn that. And also, it's vital that you know linear algebra. In physics, a knowledge of calculus and linear algebra is absolutely essential. And there's a hidden fourth um, prerequisite in all the physical courses, and that's the uh, subject of combinatorics. Unless you're doing some kind of hard combinatorics at the end, you probably haven't done any science. So it's vital that you also are familiar with some basic notions from combinatorics, counting things, pigeonhole principles, 
that can't hurt. We won't explicitly use these techniques in this course, but there will be occasion that, that sometimes our problems will reduce the counting problems. So these are the three core prerequisites. Make sure you know your calculus well, fundamental theorem of calculus, multivariable calculus. You need to know how to change variables in a multi-dimensional integral. You need to know linear algebra. Do you know what a matrix is as a linear mapping? How do, what's an eigenvalue? What's an eigenvector? Make sure you know that stuff. And combinatorics to the extent that you know about basic counting finite sets, perhaps finite graphs. These prerequisites are vital. We can't, you, I would suggest that you pause this video right now and make sure you're familiar with these things before listening on. All right, let's get started with a quick overview today on gravity pre-relativity. So we'll start with the uh, underlying assumption of Newtonian physics. So gravity pre-Einstein was that of Newton. And in Newtonian physics, one can uh, summarize or uh, or, or extract the, the, the fundamental assumptions underlying Newtonian physics and the underlying assumption that we will break, and so this is really a, uh, a common thread in all of physics, is that one makes assumptions or implicitly makes assumptions in physical theories and that as one learns more about the universe, one is forced to reevaluate and potentially change or break these assumptions. And that's certainly the case in the development of general relativity. And the core assumption that will be broken in the transition from pre-relativity to relativity physics is that of the assumption of the existence of a preferred reference frame. So in Newtonian physics, underlying it all is the assumption of the existence of a preferred reference frame of a reference system not only of, of uh, rulers, but also um, clocks. So I'll just say a preferred reference system uh, and clocks. So this is the assumption of Newtonian physics. In Newtonian physics, we assume the existence of a preferred reference system and clocks. And uh, we could d denote or draw such a reference system, something like this, three coordinate axes. And we would call this system inertial. So this, this reference system is preferred and inertial if the trajectories of a finite test mass, or free test mass, let's say, upon which no force acts moves along a straight line. So I'll highlight that here. In this particular preferred reference frame, free test masses. So it's important to say that free means no force acts. That these move along a straight trajectory. And do they move along the straight trajectory at a non-constant rate? No, they move along the straight trajectory at a constant rate. And that's the, the clocks. They tick at a constant rate in this preferred reference frame. So in particular, this means a constant displacement per unit time. And this is an, a so-called inertial reference frame, or indeed inertial reference frames are defined with respect to this property that free test masses move on straight trajectories at constant rates. Um, there is one preferred reference frame of system and clocks, but you can get other ones by making so-called Galilean boosts. Uh, if you move at constant velocity with respect to this preferred reference frame, then you will also note that all free test masses move along straight trajectories at a constant rate uniformly in time. 
And now is the moment to recall Newton's second law, which tells us the trajectory or how to calculate the trajectories of particles in such reference frame. And it's written with respect to an inertial reference system as the following. So with respect to uh, an inertial reference system. So just remember this formulation in Newtonian mechanics. Namely that the acceleration of the test mass or test particle is determined by the force acting on it. So F here, this is more for notation sake. F is, denotes the force, force is a three vector here. Mi denotes the so-called inertial mass of the particle. And X double dot is the acceleration of the test particle. So this is Newton's second law underlying Newtonian physics. Now, interestingly, you can write, this is all with respect to an inertial reference frame, but you can write the equations of motions with respect to non-inertial reference frames. And that's a key, uh, this is something we're gonna do a lot in general relativity because we're going to have test masses moving in, ex in gravitational fields. Gravitational fields induce acceleration. So with respect to say static lab-based reference frames where, where particles will move on, uh, uh, they will be falling and accelerating, but with respect to the accelerating reference frame of a full, freely falling test mass, things will look different. So with respect to non-inertial reference system frame, um, we can also uh, write out Newton's equations, N Newton's second law. There's no difficulty in doing this. And how do we do this? Well, we, we introduce some unit vectors. Well, this is one way of doing it. We're going to do it another way in the next lecture. So we define uh, three unit vectors. And we'll call them x hat prime. And the thing about these unit vectors, x hat prime t, is that they change with time. So they describe the unit vectors with respect to a moving or accelerating reference frame. So the, here are the three unit vectors that we're going to use to describe things in our accelerating or non-inertial reference frame. So we introduce these three unit vectors, x prime, y prime, z prime. We assume that they're orthonormal. And in an inertial reference frame determined, sorry, in a non-inertial, right, um, frame determined by these vectors, then trajectories of straight lines might look curved because if you're accelerating with respect to an inertial reference frame, the trajectory of a free uh, test mass won't look straight anymore. Right? You accelerate. So in a reference frame with respect to this basis, well, let's start it off in our old reference frame. So if we go back to our uh, uh, initial inertial reference frame, let's go back up here, I've drawn it here, then one can introduce the unit vectors pointing along the coordinate axes as x hat, y hat, and z hat, these are the original unit vectors. So in the reference with respect to the old basis, we can write uh, the trajectory of a test mass as, we can decompose it with respect to these three unit vectors, so we have wx, Wx is the coordinate uh, component in the x direction of the 
displacement vector of this test mass, wy, it's also the y component, so on, blah, 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 wz, and, uh, and fine. So we've described with these three numbers the trajectory of a, of a particle with respect to an inertial reference frame. These are just the coordinates. Uh, but, of course, we want to describe things with respect to our new reference frame. How do we do that? Well, we just write everything in terms of this new basis. It's a, it's a moving basis. This basis moves in time. Okay, remember these uh, x, y's and z's are vectors. Okay, one short aside on notation. Uh, I use... Um, notation, uh, I use the underline to denote a three vector or even a four vector. This just denotes a vector. If you've watched any of my other videos or been through any of my other courses, you'll, you'll probably be familiar with this notation. I tend to use lowercase letters to denote vectors. Uh, then matrices, I put three, two lines underneath. So a matrix times by a vector looks something like this. Tend to use that notation, but that I'm not going to use a three line notation for tensors. I think that's ridiculous for some reason. And so we're not going to be doing that. Tensors will always be clear from context when we introduce them. Like I'm not expecting that you know what a tensor is. Um, that's something we're going to introduce in this course. Uh, I, I won't use underline notation. If you're watching this again for review, I won't be using this underlying notation. Instead, we'll probably that we'll have shifted over to index notation by that point here. Also, I should pause to mention uh, index notation. Also, something that you should have picked up in a special relativity course, or even indeed uh, a reasonably advanced course on mechanics. Uh, we refer to elements of vectors and matrices with the, also with the index notation. So if we have a vector A, then we can denote the X component of A uh, with a square brackets and an X, or we might write it as AX. Similarly for matrices, I have the x, y component of a matrix, then I'm also going to use the notation x subscript x, y. Uh, probably, in fact, very quickly, we're going to see that when we move to relativity physics, I'll be putting that index upstairs as well. We'll explain the upstairs notation when we get there. So there it is. That's some notations that we're going to be using when we're expressing uh, vector quantities. In, in Newtonian physics, and certainly we're going to, this notation will transition to the relativity world as well. All right, so there's, if we go back to here, what was our goal? Well, we have a trajectory with respect to an inertial reference frame, but we can also express that trajectory with respect to a non-inertial reference frame as soon as we've chosen a uh, set of unit vectors for the non-inertial reference frame, no problems there. That's a, it's a little linear algebra computation. And when you do that, so suppose you insist on working with respect to a non-inertial reference frame, well, just substitute this stuff into here, this stuff here into Newton's second law, and then you'll see that you get, that Newton's second law looks different. So we're going to, that's a homework question. Also, we'll see it in the next lecture anyway. Um, so, and one way of summarizing this, I suppose, is that physics in non-inertial reference frames um, you know, as captured by the second law Newton's second law, not the second law of thermodynamics, as captured by Newton's second law, um, gives rise 
to additional forced-like terms. And uh, these are called inertial forces. And I'll give you some examples. So we have the centrifugal force, centripetal force, Coriolis, Euler, etc., etc. Depending on the ex the non-inertial reference frame that you you have to work with, you'll pick up different additional terms on the right hand side. And uh, and this is there will be a homework question on this. Okay, we're gonna distinguish forces or true forces from such apparent forces. So there's, you know, obviously these centripetal, centrifugal, Coriolis, Euler and so on forces, they're not true, right? It's just that we, we, we were decided to be a bit stubborn and describe physics with respect to an accelerating reference frame. So true forces are ones that don't arise from being in a non-inertial reference frame. So such apparent inertial forces. So that's really crucial that we distinguish between these, these two things. Uh, in particular, in Newtonian physics, This is one of those core assumptions that we're going to have to revisit when we go to the relativity, go to general relativity. So in particular, in Newtonian physics, uh, gravity is a true force. But this will not be true in GR. GR, of course, is general relativity the pretty much universally accepted acronym for general relativity is GR, the pretty much universally accepted acronym for special relativity is SR. Okay, that's just a short reminder to set some notation of, the, of some concepts underlying Newtonian physics. And indeed, these are concepts we're gonna to have to revisit when we uh, build up general relativity. Now, let's uh, in particular, these are the, this is the concept of force in Newtonian physics and reference frames. Now let's discuss mass. Mass is another concept that's uh, fundamental in Newtonian physics and also in relativity physics and also in quantum mechanics. To, uh, but it turns out that although it seems intuitively clear that you know, what mass is capturing, there's in fact several independent notions or conceptually distinct quantities that you can call mass. And this we should um, uh, separate out these, these different conceptually distinct quantities uh, because arguing that they're the same uh, is, is, a, is a good deal of interest, it led to a good deal of interesting physics. So there's at least, uh, I'll say at least because depending on how Baroque you're feeling, you might be able to think of ways to have uh, a notion of mass that aren't captured by these lower three, but I think these three will capture everything in Newtonian physics. There's at least three conceptually distinct quantities that we could call mass. And we're gonna distinguish between them, right? So the first one is the so-called inertial mass, the one familiar from the second law that I wrote down just above and I even introduced it up there. And I'm gonna do it differently. This is the constant of proportionality. This is the constant of proportionality in Newton's second law. So Newton's second law, right, in, in abbreviated vector form is F equals MA. What's this M? M is the inertial mass, right, of the particle. It's the constant of proportionality that relates acceleration to the force. 
But there's another notion, in fact, two other notions, which are not often distinguished, but you should distinguish them. It's an exercise to prove that, in fact, they're the same. The next notion is the notion of active gravitational mass. And so this is the, the, the mass that, that appears in the law that produces the gravitational field that other masses respond to. So if you recall the gravitational force law, G is the gravitational field produced by a mass. And it has it is described by the following formula, minus big G times by M little g A, this is the so-called active mass, X minus X prime, which is the displacement between the producing mass and the, the, the test mass that responds to this field. divided by x minus x prime cubed. So x prime is the location of the generating mass. Sorry, I probably said it the wrong way around. Let me write it correctly. So x prime is the location of the generating mass. And uh, big G is the gravitational constant. given by the following number, 6.674301515 is uncertain, times 10 to the minus 11 is massively tiny, meters cubed, kilograms minus one, seconds minus two. So the fact that big G is so tiny makes understanding quantum gravity so difficult. Okay, so we have a notion of, of, of so-called active gravitational mass. That's the, the mass that's responsible for producing a gravitational field. But there's another one, right? There's another notion of mass that's sort of, at least a priori, uh, independent notion or conceptually distinct notion. That's the passive gravitational mass. And this is the mass that responds to an external gravitational field by accelerating. So this is the notion of mass that's responsible for responding to an external gravitational field. By accelerating. And the formula for that is given by Newton's second law, mg, we'll call this m subscript g, but now with a p up the top, times by g, the gravitational field. It's the passive gravitational mass. Now, it is assumed should note this, right? It's an assumption underlying a lot of physics that these masses are non-negative. So this is a typical assumption, but not proved, right? You can't deduce the non-negativity of mass. It's an assumption and observed, supported by extensive obs uh, physics observations. But it's an assumption that these are all non-negative. Uh, interestingly, it is possible to, to build physics uh, with negative masses. It's not uh, at least immediately inconsistent. There have been attempts to build physics with negative masses and things hold together. It's very fascinating, the physics of negative masses, they're, they're more like negative charges and all kinds of crazy things can happen when you have negative masses, but it doesn't 
lead to immediate breakdowns of the laws of physics, at least as far as what, uh, if, you, if you think about it, if you try and pursue the, the, the theory, there's no obvious breakdowns in, in physics. And people have pursued this. Now, there's a reason why we don't talk about these three masses, these three, concept, uh, three distinct conceptually distinct uh, notions of mass, because there's actually relationships that you can prove and pretty much immediately. Um, between these three concepts. And it's an exercise for you to show that really we don't bother with the difference between passive and active um, gravitational mass. And the reason we don't ever bother with it is because if you use Newton's third law, you can actually show you can argue that MGA, the active gravitational mass, divided by MGP, the passive gravitational mass, is a universal constant. So if you choose your units right, you can just arrange for them to be the same. We conclude that MGA equals MGP equals some universal gravitational mass. So that's why you never really talk about the difference between these two gravitational masses. You can just use Newton's third law. So it's, an, it's a very good exercise for you to think this through. Do do these exercises. They will also appear on the exercise sheets anyway, uh, so you're pretty much forced to do these exercises if you're taking this course. Now, you know, we, we can get bold now. We've seen that the active and the passive gravitational masses are the same. So maybe we can just prove using Newton's whatever laws that um, there's a, a direct relationship between the inertial and gravitational mass. Well, you can't. And that's really an amazing... This has led to, you know, this is part of the ingredients that led Einstein to the general theory of relativity. That the fact that you can't prove that the same, but, and this is crucial, they appear to be equal, right? So this has been tested a lot. There's extensive, so these, these quantities, these concepts of gravitational inertial mass are, are, are independent con conceptual notions However, extensive experimental evidence suggests, right? It doesn't prove, it suggests that mg equals mi. Uh, so the hypothesis that they're equal hasn't been rejected yet. Could be that they're not equal. There are extensive experiments. There are experiments continuing to this day that test the relationship between mg and mi, but there's no so far, there's no uh, contradiction to the hypothesis that mg equals mi. This leads us to the following postulate. Which we're going to call the universality of free fall or UFF for short. And the universality of free fall, what does it say? It says that in a gravitational field G, the orbit of a test mass only depends on initial conditions. And given initial conditions that are the same, then the same trajectory will be the same for all test masses all the way around. Orbit in a gravitational field G, the orbit of a test mass only depends on the initial conditions. That's the statement of universality of free fall. And if you have 
the same initial conditions, then you're going to get the same trajectory for all test masses. Cool. So initial conditions I'll abbreviate with IC. So the same ICs, initial conditions, will give the same trajectories, not for just for one test mass, but for all test masses. So let's investigate some consequences of the universality of free fall, this postulate. So we assume that we have a, a test mass, which is a point, right? Okay. I haven't said this um, so far, but you should visualize a test mass as a point. I'll just write that in quote marks because the minute you invoke quantum mechanics, all of this goes completely crazy. Um, and even indeed points in general relativity are pretty, pretty, uh, let's say hairy topics. You know, if you concentrate a certain amount of mass into a, a teeny tiny radius, you're going to get black holes. So, but it's an idealized notion, the notion of a test mass as a point. So you have a test mass in, in a gravitational field. So you, you know, could draw a gravitational field as a bunch of arrows that sort of point to something heavy, like a planet. This is a gravitational field G, it depends on your position. And so you've got a test mass in this gravitational field. And so I'll draw the test mass, I don't know, green, maybe. So here's the test mass. Make sure it's actually green when I say it's green. Here's the test mass, it's this green dot and it's moving on some trajectory in this gravitational field generated by this heavy object according to the gravitational force law. And uh, well, what trajectory does it follow? Well, this one, right? We apply Newton's second law, mg, times by the gravitational field. Where do we evaluate it? Where the particle is, xt. And uh, it's gotta be equal to the inertial mass times by the uh, acceleration of this particle, the test mass. And rewriting this, we see that the acceleration of the test mass is equal to the ratio of the, iner of the gravitational and inertial masses times by the gravitational force field. And it's this ratio which will be a universal constant according to UFF. So we're going to choose units from now on. So that mg equals mi. So I, I've sort of implied this already, but there's an important remark. UFF is not a consequence of Newtonian theory. It's a falsifiable hypothesis. And two, UFF relates to test masses. Now, test masses, I, as I already sort of implied, are a bit of a subtle concept um, because you know you can't have a, a finite mass in an infinite, infinitely small uh, volume. Um, further, you know what happens when you have lots of test masses and they generate their own gravitational fields. There's an element of subtlety there that we won't dive, delve too deeply into because we will resolve this in general relativity anyway. So now I've spent some time reviewing some concepts in Newtonian physics. The next part of the lecture today 
we'll be uh, beginning the transition from Newtonian physics to general relativity. And we'll see how some of these concepts, these fundamental assumptions allowing Newtonian physics have to be revised. And how other aspects of Newtonian physics will inform the development of general relativity. So this next part of the lecture will be called From Newtonian Gravity to General Relativity. And here we're going to explain how you might first attempt to incorporate relativity and Newtonian physics together and gravity. And we'll, I'll also expand a little bit on how gravity and special relativity are incompatible. Although I say that essentially with quote marks, because as you'll see that the more you think about it, the more you can make gravity compatible with special relativity, the closer you get to general relativity. So, so but as we're going to transition from Newtonian to general relativity, uh, Newtonian gravity to general relativity, the first step we want to do is to formulate Newtonian gravity as a field theory. So this is, uh, this is indeed possible. You probably haven't seen it formulated like this. And uh, it's a, a more or less essential ingredient if we want to express Newtonian gravity as somehow a uh, theory compatible with special relativity. Uh, and the, the motivation comes from electrodynamics, right? You know, electrodynamics is compatible with special relativity. And the reason it's compatible with special relativity is that, that that information propagates at the speed of light and that uh, Lorentz transformations leave Maxwell's equations invariant. So electrodynamics and SR are compatible, right? That's the, uh, that's the motivation for why we're going to try and discuss Newtonian theory as a field theory. You can do it. Newtonian field, gravity is a field theory. And since, uh, and you know, why would we even think this is possible? Well, because basically Newtonian gravity looks very, very much like electrostatics, right? Um, so. so Newtonian gravity is sort of like electrostatics. And when you do electrodynamics, you learn how to make Electrodynamics, right? You take, you have your static theory, this electrostatics theory. You add in dynamics, and then woof, it's uh, you get Maxwell's equations, and all is compatible with special relativity. And we could hope by doing the same, right? You know, we start with elect Newt Newton gravity as a, as a static field theory. We could hope that by modifying it in a similar way, we might get um, a, a, a beautiful theory of gravity and uh, combined with relativity. So let, let me just, before, uh, before I explain why that doesn't quite work, um, let's highlight some similarities between Newton gravity or gravitostatics and electrostatics. So that's our next goal. Let's highlight some similarities, right? Well, firstly, the gravitational field is determined by an equation. You know, where do you get the, what is the gravitational field for a start? Well, you give it a time and a, a location and it'll give you a force vector. So the gravitational field is a field. It takes in a time coordinate, it takes in a space coordinate, and it gives you a vector. Right, time, space, you give it a time and a space and the gravitational field as a mathematical object hands you a vector, a force vector. So mathematically, a gravitational, the gravitational field is a field, right? You give it a location, space, time and it gives you a vector. So it's a vector field, just like the, the electric field, right? And so what's a source for this field? Well, the gravitational masses, right? any mass. So the gravitational mass density is a source for the gravitational field. So mathematically, the gravitational force field is a field. 
and it's generated or is sourced by the, the density of gravitational mass. And the density of gravitational mass is also a field. We call it rho. It goes to rho plus because we assume that mass is non negative. So, rho, give it a time and a space. It's mathematically a field as well. It just tells you how much mass density is in that uh, location of space time. And uh, how does mass density uh, source the gravitational field? Well, it has to obey an equation. Well, this equation, right? That the divergence of the gravitational field equals minus 4 pi big G times rho. It's just like Coulomb's law, right? It's just like Coulomb's law. So in Newtonian physics, if you have some mass density around, gravitational mass density, then that generates the gravitational field. How do you compute it? We'll take the divergence of the gravitational field force field and set it equal to minus four pi g times rho. Then you've got yourself the gravitational field, big G here. Uh, so this is just like Coulomb's law, right? This is looking good, right? You know, when we built up electrodynamics, we started out with electrostatics and then we added in dynamics and then everything worked fine. Now, because of basic vector rules, vector differential operator rules, we have that if you take the curl of, uh, of G, you get zero. So G is conservative, just like the electric field. So what, can that, what does that tell us? It does actually tell us something, just as in electrostatics, you know, by Poincaré's lemma, we learn the existence of a potential, phi, which is also a field, a scalar field, so that, uh, or such that the gravitational field G can be obtained by taking the, the, the minus the gradient of the scalar gravitational potential. And these minus signs are convention. Put a plus sign there if you're feeling perverse. Um, but then you have to propagate it everywhere throughout your calculations. So we, uh, just as in electrostatics, We can divide a, uh, we can obtain a field equation for, for phi, the gravitational potential. You can derive a field equation, the Laplace operator times by phi. It's 4 pi g rho. So the scalar potential is determined by the mass density, gravitational mass density, where that's Poisson equation. If you want a review of electrodynamics and you happen to speak German, then you can check out my Theoretische Physik B lectures Otherwise, there are no shortage of very good lectures on YouTube or tutorials on the basics of electrodynamics. So, so far, gravi the Newton gravity looks very much like electrostatics. In fact, sort of symbol for symbol, you can substitute everything. Now we've got a, a, a Lorentz force law. So there's an equation of motion for test masses, which would be the analog of the Lorentz law. And that is that the acceleration of a test mass is minus grad phi t where evaluated where the test mass actually is. And uh, 
that's also a, a very interesting um, analog of electrostatics. Or oh, I should say that I've assumed here, so for the mathematically um, minded, that there is some assumptions underlying the, the solution to Poisson's equation um, that I'm about to, to show. I'm going to assume here that the support of the gravitational mass density field is compact. What does that mean? It means that there's not a continuous distribution of matter throughout the universe. In fact, the, the distribution of matter is stuck in finite regions. So if you know some topology, which is not strictly necessary for this course, um, what I'm assuming here is that the closure of the set of points where the gravitational mass density is not zero, uh, that, that that set is compact. And since we're, we're in uh, uh, in Euclidean space, then we can invoke the heine bogle theorem and we learn that that's a closed and bounded region. So if the mass density, gravitational mass density, we're going to assume that the gravitational mass density is, is restricted to finite regions. Now, we've got this, this Poisson equation for the gravitational scalar potential. Uh, can we deduce the gravitational scalar potential as a function of rho? Well, yes, we can. We've done that in electrostatics. And as long as you're a bit careful about your boundary conditions to prevent weird soliton solutions. So as long as the gravitational scalar potential is assumed to decay to zero, as you go out to infinity, then we get a unique solution for the gravitational scalar potential, just as we do in electrostatics. It's minus g, the integral over all of space three-dimensional integral you take the gravitational uh, you take the gravitational mass density divided by x minus x prime take the norm and then integrate that over all of space and uh, and then you have a nice well-defined gravitational scalar potential and so we have a beautiful analog of electrostatics that we might call gravitostatics. And seeing this, you'll be like, oh, this is great. Well, let's just do what we did for electrodynamics. And we've combined relativity and gravitational, Newtonian gravity theory. So let's just talk a little bit about what happens if you try and do that. So how to add dynamics to the gravitational field. So at the moment, the gravitational field in this discussion is static. It doesn't change with time. So we have you know, some options for how to add dynamics to the gravitational field. So what happens if the, the, the mass density that sources the gravitational field, what happens if that changes? Well, we could just assume instantaneous propagation. Or we could add dynamics to the gravitational field by assuming a scalar wave equation for phi. Just that's not what happened in electrodynamics, but hey, we could do it here. It's allowed. We could do the electrodynamics thing. We could complete the gravitational scalar uh, potential to a vector, to a four vector. It's a third option. And just like for electrodynamics, Or we could complete phi to a tensor, in this case, a symmetric tensor. This will make more sense as we go through the course. 
that would be a fourth option, fifth, five, fifth and sixth options. But interestingly, some things happen when you follow up these assumptions. Now, there's a very beautiful discussion of this in Mesna Thorn and Wheeler, Chapter 7. I highly recommend you go and take a look at it. Where they follow up all of these options for adding dynamics to the gravitational field. So, uh, I don't really need to say much about the zeroth version. There's obvious causality problems that make it incompatible with special relativity. You know, you can sig by moving masses around, you can signal faster than the speed of light. So, you know, zero is out, right? You can't do that. Now, one, you can do, but it's ruled out by observations because it, there's no bending of light, which has been observed. Two, you can do uh, as well, but there's problems with the per perihelion precession. So that's ruled out by experiments as well. And also you get negative energy waves. It's pretty bad. So we're left with three, or are we left with three? Maybe there's more options. So three, if you follow up completing the scalar gravitational potential to a, a four a tensor, the rank two tensor, then you actually uh, discover something pretty amazing. This route leads to uh, the linearized Einstein equation. And sort of implicitly and indirectly, you go to GR. So really by taking Newton's theory of gravity and trying to make it compatible with special relativity and the observations and available experimental observations, you are forced to think of completing the gravitational scalar potential to a tensor. When you go down that route, you discover that the dynamics you give to the gravitational field are governed by a linearized form of Einstein's field equations. And then by somewhat indirect, but you know, logically, uh, a logically okay argument, you can then get um, general relativity or deduce general relativity. We are not going to do that this way, and Einstein certainly did not follow this route, or at least we don't know from the historical record whether Einstein followed this route. Instead, we're going to discover general relativity in a completely different other way. That's it for, t for lecture one. Uh, thank you for joining me on this journey, and I look forward to seeing you in the next lecture.